I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the New Testament to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll pick up this morning in verse 6 and read down through verse 12. Once more, I remind you that this is the word of our God, inspired, infallible, inerrant. So let's give our attention to its reading. Now we commend you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. For you yourselves know how, how you often, how you ought to imitate us. Because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Rest with us. The flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we are bringing our study of 2 Thessalonians to an end, we come this morning to that reminder that church life has ups and downs. The Thessalonians certainly knew this reality. They had responded to the gospel that Paul had proclaimed, and immediately a church was formed. No sooner had it been formed, though, than they faced opposition from all sides, it seems. This is the pattern that we see in the book of Acts. Wherever the gospel took root, there was also opposition. Not all the opposition was from outside the church, though. Much of what the church faced there in those early years were problems within the church, both in belief as well as in practice. Paul writes this book to address really all of these concerns, the problems from outside as well as those from within, the struggles they had from outside concerning their afflictions, and the first chapter looked at that. But then the book went on, or the letter went on, to address various beliefs they held and the practices that they that fell out of that came out of those beliefs. And in fact, we see how Second Thessalonians follows these three topics, one per chapter. For again, in the first chapter, Paul is concerned to address the afflictions that they faced. In chapter one and verse four, we read, as Paul says, we boast. We ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the, the afflictions that you are enduring. The apostle did not want to sidestep or diminish the suffering that they faced. But in chapter 2 we saw that Paul addresses a major concern about their beliefs. If you look back at chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we read, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter, seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, that no one deceive you in any way. There the Apostle Paul laid out what it is that was necessary before Christ would return, not in order for people to figure out a different date to expect Jesus, but rather to remind them that no man knows the day or the hour, and to comfort them with the reality that God had not abandoned them, Christ had not come, and they had been left behind. No. And so Paul addresses their errant beliefs. But in chapter 3, Paul turns to consider a matter of practice. Because the reality is, what you believe about the coming of Jesus is actually going to inform how you live. Is actually going to inform life within the church. As we've said before, when we go on a trip, on a long road trip, the destination determines the direction. And so also, what we believe about Christ's return will determine in part how it is that we live day by day. And this is what Paul begins to address in chapter 3. 
And we saw that in the opening opening verses of chapter 3 last week. Paul giving, getting ready to give his final exhortations to this young congregation. He begins though by taking a position of humility and asking them for prayer. And this makes sense to us. We looked at that. He's going to address the concerns he has about them, about their work or their labors. And the prayer that he asks for that from them is for his own labors. And as we looked at those verses last week, we noted that God, who is over all, oftentimes works through means. As our confession reminds us that God, in His ordinary providence, makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at His pleasure. And the reality that Paul teaches us here in chapter 3 is that we ought not to expect God to work outside of the ordinary means that He has given to us. A clear example of this is in the matter of salvation. It is true that God is able to call anyone to faith and repentance in His time and in any way, but ordinarily He works through the means that He has given were sacraments and prayer. And indeed, especially the proclamation of the gospel when it comes to the matter of salvation. We can think about the Christian life and the struggles that we might face. Scriptures lay out for us that God has given ordinary means by which we can grow in the faith, those, the word, the sacraments, and prayer. And we can all but guarantee that if we neglect those things, we are going to begin to feel distant from God. Paul's words here and the pattern that he, teach, that he uses teaches us that if we don't use the means God has given, we shouldn't be surprised if we don't see the results that He has promised. That's not a way of binding God uh, to anything that we do, but rather it's reminding us of the promises that our God has made. Well, Paul talks about all of this in the context, in the opening verses of proclaiming Christ. It was his desire that they would be tireless in their efforts, in, their, in, in, in the ministry that God had given to them to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. But as the Reformers noted so many years ago, it is not only those who are ministers who have a calling to do or who have a work from the Lord. Scriptures have a lot to say about the ordinary work that we do in this life. And this is what Paul turns our attention to for the rest of this chapter, at least most of the rest of chapter 3. Now Paul has already instructed them in these matters back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Just before he goes on to speak about the hope of the resurrection, he says, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may live properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And so the Christian's work is the theme of our text this morning. Paul's desire builds, though, not just on his creativity or his idea of work, but really we can go all the way back into the Old Testament and we can see how it is that Scripture speaks of the work that God gives to His people. Indeed, man was created in part to work. And while work is affected by the fall into sin, it is not itself the product of sin or the product of the fall. Adam and Eve were to work and to keep the Garden of Eden, to fill the earth and to subdue it. Their pain-free and thornless work did not last, though, as they were cast out of the garden. But make no mistake, they were to continue to work. Yes, with pain and sweat. The word work would be considered toil. It would be tiresome, wearisome even, and yet the purpose of Scripture in the Old and New Testaments is to remind God's people that this is what God has given to us, and we are not to look at it as though it is something less than a blessing. We could say more. You could read the book of Ecclesiastes. You could go to the book of Proverbs that speaks against idleness that we read of in our text this morning. Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 11, Solomon writes, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise without having any chief officer or ruler. She prepares her, her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there with sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. I want to draw out these Old Testament uh, connections because the Old Testament saints were waiting for the Messiah even as New Testament saints are waiting they didn't know when Christ would come. They didn't even know what the fullness of things would look like. But they had a promise that He would come. But that, that promise did not nullify their call to faithfulness in their labor. 
And the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 that in the Lord, our own labor is not in vain. That is, it is not vanity. It has meaning, it has significance. God has given to us work, and that is exactly what Paul wants us to understand in this text this morning. So let's go to our text and see how this unfolds before us first with the command to work. And make no mistake, it is a command. It's a command that is grounded there in Jesus Christ Himself. Look at verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you again that that use of the word Lord there, as we saw already in 2 Thessalonians as well as in 1 Thessalonians, it is Paul's way of understanding the deity of Jesus Christ. Nothing less than the one who is very God of very God, Yahweh, the great I Am of the Old Testament. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where Paul begins his theology of Christian work. It is not a recommendation. The word he uses here for command is a strong one. It is meaning that something that must be done. It must be done because it's grounded in Jesus Christ and not in Paul. He might read the words of the Apostle Paul and just think, he's a workaholic. No wonder he wants people to be that way. But that's not the approach that he takes. But rather, he wants people to eat, whether they eat or whether they drink, or whatsoever things they do, they do all to the glory of God. The Apostle Paul has much to say on this matter as he writes to the various churches. He even has opportunity to remind the people who were, who were, who were servants, slaves, to, to render their task as, those, as though they were serving Christ himself. And this is the important connection that we'll see throughout this text is that our work, is, it, it matters not because, or, or, or the very least because it is rendered to God himself. He is our master. We are his servants. And before we see that, we see the matter of what he commands here. He says that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. Those have already noted, and we note this each time we see it in the New Testament. The early church had many, many struggles. There is no perfect church this side of glory. The truth is that even the best of churches will have people among them that struggle. This must be the case, for the church is a place for people that struggle. But here Paul is focusing our attention on those who are idle. The first thing to note is the term, it means walking in idleness, and it implies that this is not a one-time offense. As I said, you could think of the Apostle Paul as a bit of a workaholic, and maybe he's expecting everyone to work at the same level that he does, and that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about those who walk in idleness. It is a way of life for them. It is a kind of laziness, or, or, or really in some ways an undisciplined life. He goes on here, because the term that we have for idleness speaks to living a life that is disordered. Idleness and laziness are included, to be certain, but that is not the extent of it. As we'll see, they were quite busy in other things. But their energies were being used in a way that was unproductive and even destructive to the faith. As I said, Paul's already addressed this to the Thessalonians. We looked already in chapter 4, but in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul says, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And surely you pick up on the fact that he is here saying that, that, that there's a call for patience even as they are called to not or to pull away from those who walk in idleness. And we see again that the term tradition is used here. It's not the first time that Paul has used the, the term. It was back in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15 where Paul says to stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. We don't have time to rehash everything that that word means for tradition, but suffice it to say it has to do with the doctrines that the apostles had taught them that were grounded in the word of God. It was not some secret amount of, or some secret knowledge that was passed down from the apostles to the other apostles to the other apostles as though that was kept hidden from the eyes and ears of the common people. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The tradition was told to everybody. 
And if we know Acts chapter 17, right after the Thessalonians, Paul goes to the church of the Bereans or establishes the church of Berea. And he says they were more noble because they searched the scriptures and examined them to see if these things were so. Implying that the traditions themselves could be held up to the light of scripture. And so banish the thought that this is somehow some capital T tradition that undermines the authority of Scripture or comes alongside of the authority of Scripture, but rather it is, it is what is being taught, the doctrine is being taught in light of Scripture. But note that Paul says in his concern that you keep away from any brother who walks in idleness. So the word that he uses here is, means simply to put a distance between oneself and someone else. This is important because we want to avoid any idea that suggests that they are to be put outside of the church, to be excommunicated, or even to be thrust aside. The focus here is not on the forcible exclusion of these people from the fellowship, but on a refusal to associate with them. Giving them an opportunity to reflect, to find a proper use for their energies, and to keep them from causing strife among others. And to drive this home, it's important to see that the Apostle Paul calls them here brothers. He is not calling into question at this point their profession of faith in Christ, but his desire is that they would walk in accord with that profession. And here we are reminded of the reality of life together. That as we walk through this life together, we each have strengths and weaknesses. There are places where we are strong in the faith and places where we are weak in the faith. And those places where we are weak, and we'll consider this even further next week, we, we do need to be confronted in those things, in those areas. But it needs to be done gently. We are not to walk around with some kind of a club to bash each other over the head uh, uh, as though we call into question whether or not we are saved. Paul's use of the term brother reminds us that we are all in need of various corrections. The church is not perfect. As the Puritan Richard Sibbs reminds us, the church of Christ is a common hospital wherein all are in some measure sick of some spiritual disease or other. And we should all have ground of exercising mutually the spirit of wisdom and of meekness. So Paul commands... Uh, this, this idea of work, and he's going to go further in the command, but he, he's commanding specifically to, to keep away from those who walk in idleness. And then he goes on to show the reasons for this. Look at verse 7 with me. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we work night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. But there are some key words here that we want to, want to note. First, we see the responsibility that, that the leaders of the church have. Hebrews 13 and verse 7, we read, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Back to our text, then Paul says, You yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. And so Paul push, pushes home the reality that, that, that the believers there in Thessalonica were not to be idle and, and, and that they were to walk according to the way that they had been shown by the apostles. And again, we are reminded of our life together, how we learn from one another, how we learn about our walk before God. And I draw this out each and every time we bring new members in, each and every time we have a, a covenant child who is baptized to remind us that we are, we, we, we are watching one another, not in the way of trying to find things that are wrong, but in the way of imitation. Our young people need to be able to look to those who are older in order to see the way that they ought to walk. What it looks like to be a believer who's married, who's wrestling with small children, and trying their best to listen to the sermon, even though everything, or at least those little ones, seem to be working against it. Our young people need to be able to see the college students among us who show their own faithfulness in attending worship each and every Lord's Day, even when they are away from home. Our college students need to be able to look and to see how it is to walk in Christ as they grow and as they, as they see the older ones among us. And elders, brothers, all of them, they are watching us 
What does it look like to walk in Christ and, 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 and to follow and obey His Word even as we face all of the struggles that we have in our lives? You want to imitate us. These are words that, that, that we as elders ought to be able to say. Now notice that Paul has something particular here. He says, because we were not idle when we were with you. He shows that they did not burden anyone. Now, we want to see how this works out because we might hear Paul and we might think that he's saying that anybody who needs help just needs to suck it up. Don't share any of your concerns, any of your needs, and nothing to be further from the truth. Galatians 6, verses 2-5, to the Apostle Paul writes, Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and that his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. <coughs> bear one another's burdens. Bear your own load. Mary the Apostle Paul uses two different words in Galatians chapter 6. And there, he's speaking of a load that is a manageable amount for one person to carry. A burden is something that is unable to be carried by one alone. And so Paul, going back to 2 Thessalonians, it wasn't so that they would not care for those in need. The problem with their idleness is that they were destructive to the community of believers. And one way, yes, was that in their refusal to work, they unnecessarily relied on others and were not able to help those who were truly in need. Now here again you'll note in verse 9 that Paul acknowledges, as he does in many of his letters, that it is right for the church to care for their ministers. He says, it was not because we do not have that right, but to give you, our, give you in ourselves an example to imitate. There was something about the church that Paul wanted to make sure to set an example. In the same way with the Corinthians, he refused to accept funds from the Corinthians. Now, keep in mind, he was receiving funds from other churches to support his ministry, but he refuses to receive them from the Corinthians so they wouldn't have authority over him. Here it seems to be so that they would understand that the Christian is called to work in this life. His point in his example, though, is that they labored to not be a burden just as these idle brothers ought to labor as well. He even says that they gave them a command. We are with you. He says, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And this is as clear of a command as we can find when it comes to Paul's instructions. Again, it's grounded in creation. And there, in creation, God made Adam and Eve, and they were to work, they were to labor, they were to care for the garden. It's grounded in the law of God in the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal. It's grounded in the blessing of God. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed and it shall be well with you. Psalm 128. It's grounded in the wisdom of God as we already read in, 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 in Proverbs 6. You can also read Proverbs 10 and Proverbs 24. Again, the Apostle Paul is laying, is bringing to bear upon, upon the Thessalonians this reality that we find throughout Scripture. And Christ's return doesn't alter that call. Indeed, it grounds it. For many times when Jesus speaks of His return, He talks about what will the Master find the servants doing? And the answer always ought to be, He ought to find them doing the task that He had given them to do. But again, notice the way that Paul words this command. If anyone is not willing to work, the command did not apply to those who could not work for some debilitating reason, but to those who were not willing to work. Not being able to work is something that the Scriptures always provided for, and God called the church to care for. Again, we see it in the Old Testament, in the laws about gleaning. You remember the story of Ruth and, and, and Naomi and the way that Ruth would go out and Boaz would, 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 would leave some of, the, some of the trimmings for her to pick up. That was a command from God. They were not to glean their, their, their fields all the way up to the edges so that Leviticus 19 and verse 10 it would be left for the poor and for the sojourner. Those who did not have a plot of land, those who were not able to care for themselves. Again, the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 5, verses 5 to 8, when he's speaking about widows, he says, She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day 
He goes on to say, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You see, beloved, this is what Paul is getting at here with the Thessalonian Christians. The call to work is, is important. It's part of who we are. It's part of how, uh, how God has made us. But also it's part of how we serve. How we serve one another. Because there were the damaging effects that we see in verse 11. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Not busy at work then implies a kind of disruptiveness. As one commentator put it, if one will not fill his day with those things that God has called him to do, he will fill it with those things he forbids. This word here for idleness, again, it means unstructured. As the idea actually carries with it a military connotation of someone who has stepped out or, or isn't standing by their post. And indeed, as Paul sees it, the, the one who is idle and his refusal to support himself would damage the ministry of the church because supporting them required the church to expend their limited resources. But there was also a disruptive influence in the church. They were, they were being busybodies. They were being busybodies. They were involving themselves in other people's lives in ways that were dragging them down. And we all, we all have an idea of what that is. We all know those people that we might go to, that we might, that we might share some of our concerns, and their, their counsel would actually lead us further and further into bitterness. Paul tells us to keep away from such people. And we don't want to misrepresent the church at Thessalonica. Paul's reference here to some suggests that it was not a widespread spread problem involving a large number of people. And even so, Paul wanted to deal with the problem before it did get out of hand. As he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Here then, Paul draws an important point that we'll come back to in more detail next Lord's Day. The community of God's people walking together to be a part of the church is commanded by God, for no Christian is an island to themselves. And here we see that to be productive part of the church is what is commanded Ephesians 4 and verse 28, the apostle writes, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him, do, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. As so we see the command to work, we see the reasons for the work, and now we see the attitudes towards work. Go to verse 12, it says, Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul clearly sees these idle, busy-body people as believers. They profess faith in Christ. They are part of the household of faith. And so he wants them to treat them as such. And in this way, it, it, this makes sense. For you don't expect an unbeliever to live a sanctified life. No, it's the believer who has died to sin. And so how can they still live in it? It's the believer who has been baptized into Christ Jesus and has been baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into His death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here, beloved, we bring the reality of Christ's return together with the reality of our redemption in Him, in His life, death, and resurrection. As Paul will say elsewhere, we are not our own. We were bought for the price. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. The truth of the matter is, as we read through Isaiah, as we think about those Old Testament saints and how they were identified by their call as well as their hope, the call that they were, that they, they walked as, as children of Abraham and the hope of the Messiah that was to come. So we, we live our lives being defined by the Gospel, our call in Jesus Christ and the hope that we have in His return. Please define us. Please define the call that we have to work. No wonder we're not to be idle. No wonder we're not to be busybodies. No wonder we are to do our work. And here Paul says quietly. That might seem like a bit of a contradiction depending on the kind of job you have. I don't even think I can do my work quietly. Anybody in my home can attest to the fact of walking by my study door and hearing me preach out loud to try to get the right wording for what I want to say. 
So undoubtedly you can relate, you have a job that requires noise. So what does Paul say here? What does he mean here to work quietly? The word actually is to be character means to be characterized by inward calm or the giving of calm attention. It can be glossed over as silence, but more likely it refers to a kind of tranquility, peace, or contentment. Contentment. To do work quietly means to be content with what God has given to us. It doesn't mean, of course, that we can't, we can't grow in our skills. It doesn't mean that we can't climb whatever ladder might be before us within our job. But rather, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we do it to the glory of our God. We entrust ourselves to His mercy and to His faithfulness, to His goodness to us. And so we do our work quietly in contentment. Again, here, the Apostle Paul, he draws this out elsewhere in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 to 2. He says, first of all, then I urge the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. And here, we need, we need to be cautious, beloved. We live in a world that is not content. We live in a culture that is, that, that is not quiet, that is not godly or dignified. And it is so easy for us to get sucked into those conversations that undermine the call to not be busybodies, that undermine the call to not walk in idleness, that undermine the call to be content in the work that God has given to us. And so Paul says to... to, to, to to do their work quietly and also to earn their own living. Now, literally, to earn their own living, you probably have a footnote in your Bibles. It means to eat or to consume their own bread. And the ESV puts it into this kind of language that we would use in our own day. When we see the original wording, we are reminded that Paul is not requiring people to rely upon their own strength, for Jesus teaches us to ask God for our daily bread. You see, and here it comes together. It comes together in the reality that, that, that God gives what it is that we are, we are called even to ask for. That God provides for us all that we need. And that we are to walk in such a way that, that, he, that he provides it. That God works through means. We pray that He would give to us our daily bread. And we contentedly work for that bread. We seek, we seek uh, to help others bear their own burdens. Those things they cannot carry on their own, even as we carry our own load. This doesn't mean that everyone has to have a particular kind of job, but rather that we are to give ourselves to the work the Lord has put before us and to be diligent in it. This is how we give God glory in all that we do, whether as a student, as a teacher, as a mother, as a laborer within the world. Whatever we do, we do it for the glory of God. And while this passage is dealing with the problem of idleness and busybodies, we know that there is also a balance so that we don't overwork. Indeed, Paul knew there was a balance. As I said already, Paul is not trying to turn everyone into the kind of machine worker that he himself undoubtedly was. The Lord has given to us a day of rest, a day of worship, an interruption in the busyness of our lives. And we might remember his goodness, his faithfulness, and we might be at peace and be challenged once again to do all that we have, all that is before us, to God's glory. You see it, beloved, the way that God calls us to view our work. Undoubtedly, we are not a congregation with idols, with, with idlers or, or busybodies. And that's good. And that's to God's glory. And yet we want to be reminded of how easy it is for some to slide into that. And so let us walk together. Let us continue to encourage one another. Let us imitate those who we see who are walking in the faith before us. And may God continue to build us up that our work, that we would know that it is not in vain. We work unto the Lord.